exciting to see so many of you here. I was afraid there was no one. <laughs> I wasn't um, expecting to see so many familiar faces, so I'm happy to see all of you, but I will admit I'm very nervous. So please forgive me if I stumble a little bit at the beginning. Um, hello, my name is my soon risk. I'm an associate professor and the head of art history at the University of Toledo in the Department of Arts, for those of you who do not know me. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the campus, I want you to be aware that the um, building in which I teach is immediately adjacent to the Toledo Museum of Art, and it's on the east end of the museum campus in the Center for the Visual Arts, which was designed by Frank Carey and opened in 1992. And if you haven't had a chance to check it out, I encourage you to go to the and during the time you're here. Um, if you do get a chance to go inside that building, make sure you make your way into the TMA Art Reference Library. There are a lot of excellent views, but that's one of my favorites. And I also um, want you to know about my forthcoming book about David Wojnarowicz, who I'll be speaking about today. Um, I just sent off the final manuscript to the publisher, which is the University of Minnesota Press. And, um, at least thus far, it will be the first art historical monograph about this artist to be written by a single author. And the book revolves around the four works that I will be sharing with you today. And I would be happy to tell you more about it, so if you share your email or business card with me after the session, that would be um, I also want to consider this session a plug for appreciating contemporary art especially for anyone who ever feels any kind of apprehension about how to look at contemporary art. Um, and especially when it comes to interpreting contemporary art. The thing about contemporary art is that there are no wrong answers when it comes to interpretation. Um, closure of meaning never has to happen. And looking at contemporary art actually lets you practice a lot of the visual literary skills that you may be trying to cultivate. So you get to decide what the art means and even come up with different ideas, and artists want you to do this. So that's my little plug. Um, I want to frame that plug with the notion that it's not like that with a lot of earlier periods of art history, like the Northern Renaissance um, and the older works that we'll briefly consider today. And for the record, despite the title of the talk, which references Peter Bruegel the Elder and Hieronymus Bosch, we will probably not have time to pause and to discuss the work of either of these artists, though if we do and if there is interest, we can come back to them. Um, I'm only showing you their work as further examples of the phenomenon of pictorial crowding that I'd like to speak about today, the picture playing is full of figures, for example, here. Since both artists, Bruegel and Bosch, were masters of this dense pictorial cycle, of a dense pictorial approach, and both could give viewers hours and hours of opportunity for developing visual literacy. And this example here is by Bruegel, the Peter Bruegel, the elder, and it's an oil on panel painting entitled The Wedding Dance. It's 42 inches high by 62 inches wide, so about three and a half feet by a little over um, five feet. And it was made in 1566, and it is still located about an hour north of here at the Detroit Institute of Arts, for any of you who are not in this area, in Detroit, Michigan. Um, I say still because, as I'm sure you've heard by now, Detroit has been going through some bankruptcy issues, and for a time, at least. There was pressure on the DIA to sell a city-owned art. For now, the pressure has lifted, and apparently the bankruptcy judge is supposed to be um, issuing his ruling tomorrow. So stay tuned. Um, but as I was saying, about the liberties of interpretation that viewers can take with contemporary art, you could go ahead and make up your own mind about earlier, older forms of art like these, just as people do with recent work. Uh, but nevertheless, there are very specific things usually going on, and messages being delivered often tied to learned, sometimes ancient texts, and their implications for the artist's current moment. It's not unusual for there to be deep, multiple layers of meaning that may not be apparent to viewers without their having to conduct extensive research. So this example here 
is by Hieronymus Bosch. It's a triptych, a three-part painting. I'm sure you all know. I didn't know how general an audience I was going to have. In Oil on Wood, entitled Garden of Earthly Delights, it's made between 1505 and 1510, and is located at the Museo del Prado in Madrid, Spain. The work is about seven feet three inches high, the central panel about six feet five inches wide, and each wing panel is nearly three feet two and a half inches wide. So I'm just giving you those factual measurements just so you have a clear indication of what this image is like. If anybody wants the lights dimmed, I don't know if I'm allowed to do that, but is it all right? Okay. And to turn to the examples that we'll look at a little bit more closely. The thing about looking and about visual literacy skills is that you can still discern things even when you do not have all the background information that can help you understand a work of culture. To put it in another way, you may pursue an interpretive theory and be completely wrong in your interpretation simply by virtue of misunderstanding the cues because of their specificity to a time and place with which you are most likely largely unfamiliar. That is, until you conduct further research. But regardless, there's still a lot to see and say about a work of art. So I'm trying to make a case that even if you don't have that background information that helps you more clearly understand what you're looking at, it doesn't prevent you from gathering a lot of information just by the act of looking. This is a, um, a practice that I try to instill or in, cultivate in my students all the time. So um, maybe I don't feel as successful as I did working on myself. Um, engaging the opportunity of trying to see and say something about any work of art in an, is an experience worth doing, especially if it helps you exercise those skills that we associate with visual literacy. And today we're going to embark on an exercise of collaborative looking with works that I'll be sharing in this slide presentation, a few of which you will find on a paper handout that you um, that I've distributed. So hopefully you gathered a copy. If you did not get a copy, um, I'm happy to provide some more. We're going to be, um, I will be giving you about five to 10 minutes, and then we'll take another 10 to 20 minutes to discuss what people have discovered. So um, that's going to come in just a bit. After our collaborative exercise of looking at one example of work by David Wojnarowicz in closer detail, I will tell you more about these works, including what they are called and when they were made. And I will share my own perspective and interpretation as reflected in my forthcoming book. So like you, I too will be practicing my visual literacy skills and possibly seeing new things in these works based on looking again, as well as hearing your own observations. Although interpreting contemporary art may not require as deep a library as is often necessary with other periods of work, it can still be helpful to know something about the artist, the time period, the circle of influence, the books that were read, the interests that were cultivated. And in my case, um, I conducted my doctoral research on this artist and was the first person to catalog his estate shortly after he died. Uh, cataloging the estate took about two years and after that, most of the material was purchased for a library at New York University, where it remains. So we'll start here with our first worksheet opportunity. And again, if you do not have a worksheet, um, just let me know. We don't have a worksheet. You don't? Here's the next one. You're welcome. Anybody else? Oh, no, it's a chair. Oh, yeah. And some people might want extra, because you might run out of room, so please feel free. I've got plenty. Um, so what I'd like to do, I also brought pencils, because I know the museum is very strict about using pencils, though usually in the gallery. I don't know how they feel about using pencils in the yellow room, but if anybody needs a pencil, I can share one. And I'd like to give you about five to ten minutes to... Um, well, actually, before I give you that time, I want to run through the questions that I'd like you to think about as you look at the image that I'm going to show you. So, um, the questions include, what do you see? Identify anything you recognize and make an inventory. If you don't recognize items, 
describe them. And feel free to use both sides of the paper and think about what formal elements capture your attention. Is it color, line, shape, texture, <coughs> space? And describe the way in which the formal element you select uh, as primary captures your attention. Um, what relationships are presented? How are the items you identified, whether you recognize them or not, situated in relation to each other or to the whole picture? Also, what overall structures or patterns do you see? What particular connections between items do you notice? How would you describe the picture's organizational systems? Does the image strike any sort of balance? And um, finally, what associations do you have with the information you compiled and the image you are studying? What kind, of, what kind of picture is this? What might the artist be communicating? Also, what is the function of this image? How do the formal elements, pictorial or symbolic, support this function? Um, and then if you have questions, what kinds of questions do you find yourself still wondering? I want you to try and write them down as well. So feel free to pick and choose any of these questions. You don't have to feel at all as if you should respond to all of them in this five or ten minutes that I'll give you. But um, everyone should at least try and answer that first question of what you see. So I'm going to give you that five to ten minutes starting now, and this is the image that I want you to consider. And again, if you want the light more dimmed, or I can move the lectern, please don't hesitate to let me know. May I borrow one of your Absolutely. Thank you.
five minutes have elapsed. Um, just in case there's extra time at the end, I, I'll go ahead and see if you guys are ready or if you want more time. We're still noticing things are taking more time. And you should bring to think. <coughs> writing if you have some other ideas or something jumps in your mind and you want to jot it down. But I'd like to hear what people have come up with. So to start with that first question of what people see, maybe you could start listing some things. And I, you, you could call it out or I could call on people if I can. Earth digging and um, living creatures. So earth, or digging, digging, living creatures. Construction, uh, uh, perspective. Construction and perspective. Mm -hmm. Please feel free. Mm -hmm. so, like a nervous system or some sort yeah. of yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. bodily um, systems. Yeah. Bodily yeah. systems. Nervous, nervous systems. Right. systems. Yeah. Body core. Yeah. Body core. Yeah. Even like yeah. Yeah. torso. <laughs> Oh, like cellular structures. Right. Cellular structures. Right. Arterial. Mm -hmm. the center of cavity. Mm -hmm. okay. And the, the map, the visual map that I said, find specific locations mm -hmm. southwest of mm -hmm. our country. Global issues. Are we on them? Despair. That, uh, that hole, I mean, it's endless. You look into that hole. And that's black hole despair. Did somebody say bunny rabbit? I thought that rodeo man. Oh, was the one like drunk and funny around Yeah, and then looked at it. I didn't notice until like looking again that he had like an arm and a hat. It looks like this is freaked out. Yeah. <laughs> so we have that hole in the center that says Bronco Buster. In the yeah. Coal, right? Coal right. Coal yeah. Coal I mean, it's like a dinosaur <laughs> in a way trying to emerge. With the face and the eyes, I know that's bizarre. It's the Indian mask. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, a culture. Here? Yeah. No, the, the center, center is like, it's like that a dinosaur or some type of ancient animal kind of or trying to come up. Like a reptile. Cancer disease. A train wreck. Right. The segment of the bridge. Shattered. Yeah. The segment of the bridge. Road bridges. Yeah. In front of there are gears in the sky. There are gears in the sky and a roadway that goes through the car. It looks like it's a road or something that makes the cross divide it in four places. Oh, these this white path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you can you see what mm -hmm. that white path is? No. Made out of. It looks like a road. Um, you see it actually, the same material in all four of those lines. And so sometimes it, some of the information might actually help you understand a little bit better what it is. Like for example, up here, there's some, some lettering 
Yeah, there's lettering in the sky. Here, there's the no more lettering in the sky. Is it newspaper? It's not a newspaper. <laughs> It is music. printing. printing. Oh, okay. Here is in the sky. There is music right here. I don't know if people can see that. Oh, yeah. they could, oh everybody saw the text. I know my eyes are clean. Yeah, and, and I don't know if it's the segments. Can I go back to the quarters? Yes. Um, if you, I don't know if it's visible on the sheet any more than it is up no. here, but you will see if you come up closer to the screen that we're looking at paper money. Mm. So that's buried as a kind of layer below a lot of this imagery. So it's the, the little bits, like here are some scenes from the back of, actually I don't know which bill it is, but I think it's, it's a picture of the White House, so that might be the $20 bill. And then we have some $1 bills over here and over there. Can you go back? Oh, to the detail. You might be able to see it in the detail. Yeah, that's true. Um, but I can see the money over there on the left, mm -hmm. or up above. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And maybe it would be easier now if we go through these details yeah. to, to pick out some of the features that you have. So I've been, I've been giving you like a counterclockwise view of the quadrants of that particular mm -hmm. thing. So this is that bottom left quadrant. The, mud, the musical staff and um, oh, there's seed. there's seed pods. Germ and there's a germinating seed yeah. over that. Oh, yeah. oh I thought that was higher. So the rib cage and the bridge, and then those gears, people already pointed out. <coughs> and then uh, let me just flip through these others, see if anything else jumps out at you. I didn't hear anybody call this. Oh, there is a brain coming out of this planet, and I think it's right around Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. look like they're represented by maybe cuts of meat. Wow, I know. Yeah, You're the, absolutely the right. It does look that way. The 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 that's really interesting. I don't know if that's the case, but you're, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. That does look like an eye there. But that's really fascinating. See, that's something I never noticed. So thank you for picking that. But what else do you see in this image that I don't think anybody's mentioned? What is that? What are those things? Pods? Pods? Ants? Ants and pods. Like tubers or something. Yes, and there is a, some kind of vegetal pod yeah. coming out of the corner, but then there's a whole colony of ants yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. crawling all over the ground. Yeah. There's that upper right it's a Hopi kachina, a head. I, I don't know my kachina lore so well that I can tell you specifically which kachina that is, but it's probably maybe somebody in the room knows. And then this, yeah, the spear being bucking that cowboy. And then one more corner. The tire treads look like zippers. Yeah, it looked like the um, the crash of the train was like a coal car. Interesting point. Yeah, and yeah. sort of all mm -hmm. what okay. if you dig up the earth to get to the coal, then you have the um, ants and everything exposed. Exposure. What exactly is the kachina mask? What is it? What's its? Well, these. What's behind it? The kachinas were, um, I guess, spirits that, yeah, that were spiritual. important to. Sorry. No, they're very spiritual. Each one has a. Well, are they related to the earth themselves? Are they? Are they representational of the earth? I think they were more animal connections. More animal connections. Yeah. Animal connections. yeah I, do you know this particular? One? No. Okay. But, but the Indians respected the land as it was, and perhaps this is it's being buried because we're exposing the land. Buried or even emerging? Emerging, right. We, we cut out the land, and then we see the, the ants, and we see the coal, and the bottomless pit. It, yeah, so in this, this form, apparently, is derived from a leaf mold image. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a sort of micro yeah. 
organic form mm -hmm. that he's borrowing. I, it took me a while to even think about what these structures were. Synapses. Anyone have any synapses? Yeah. And, and understanding them in terms of the body yeah. Yeah. makes sense. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. 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 That's a fascinating connection. I've never come across any reference to Rivera in Boynerovich's writing, or, and, but he did have some familial connections to Detroit. So it's not unlikely. I, I'll explore that. That's, thank you for that suggestion, Paula. Um, I, know, but, I know a lot of people are uh, drawing a connection to the veins or body system with the uh, the yellow mm -hmm. that separates the quadrants. Uh, to me, it reminds me a lot of a fungus or the way a slime bowl might grow underground or in a dark place. Like a root system. Sure, and then yeah. knowing that you know the center part, as you mentioned, was from a, a leaf mold, um, mold fungus, maybe almost some kind of decay or, yeah. or sickness is being yes. expressed here. Well, That's really interesting. Veins yeah. and roots are all life-like. They, they kind of yes. seem kind of Purpose, Absolutely. Know. And there, there is a lot of resonance between the human body and natural systems that, we, that this artist was very much interested in. Um, anyone else want to? Well, just in that bigger picture, <clears throat> not just what we see, but how it reads as a story. You feel like each section might be a chapter in someone's life or a page that you read into and then you read you read down into because of the details that we see and then we come back up again. Yes. I feel like the root system is a very like unifying element of the piece. Like it's completely di the composition dissected into like quadrants and the money underneath it is it even more like a dissecting factor, but then you have the roots that kind of seem like it's trying to pull it all together and unify the piece. That's great, yes. The energy. In what way? Um, well, when lightning hits the sand, it can transform sand into fossils or to a, a mineral system. That, and this sort of is all about energy in that you have the coal, you have the land. And the money that powers it. And the money that powers it, right. It's a lot of like working and wealth, right? So it's like the answer works. Those are really nice observations. Um, and it, especially interested in those kinds of <coughs> connections between objects. Like, uh, one that yeah. Boynerovich himself personally called out is the parallel between the ants moving the earth around and that bulldozer right. in the right. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even uh, from, well, one of the <coughs> impressions I've taken away from the kinds of things he described about this work, but also looking at the work, is that partly because of the size of the ant, the size is comparable to the bulldozer. It's as if the ants are, in some ways, as effective or even more effective than the bulldozer. And there's a comment in one of the interviews with this artist where he points to the fact that ants can carry 40 to 50 times their own weight. And so even that statistic of imagining an organism that can do so much with so little compared to the kind of technology that humans de depend on has led me to think that there's an argument here, a proposition about that relationship. It's interesting. Yeah. I think the relationship that he's clearly making a very obvious juxtaposition between the rotation and the aqueduct. Yeah, I, I want to hear it. more of what you think about uh, that. Just, um, I mean, it's about structure, obviously. Um, the natural um, body versus the man-made. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Absolutely. No, I, I, I've 
like the way you described it. I think absolutely that the positioning of the aqueduct bridge next to the red cage makes you realize how very often our human-made objects borrow from or are inspired by the natural world, and, and that in a way those natural forms are even maybe perfect, or they seem as if they, they can't be surpassed by the kinds of things we come up with, even if we come up with really incredible <coughs> kinds of devices. I only think that in part because of what he put down here below, where you have this kind of catastrophe that happens with our... I was just curious as to why he chose that train. And, you know, I mean, it's a Siemens, an older train, Siemens, very powerful. That's a great point. And so I'm just curious as to I don't know why he chose that one. He thought about trains. He, he used a phrase of um, calling them displacement in death. And he thought about them in terms of the way that they re-sculpted the um, natural landscape of the American country, um, and especially the way they undid or um, uh, completely transformed the indigenous western part of the country. So the, the kind of train expansion that occurred in the 1800s, immediately after the Civil War, the kinds of surveys that were conducted and the kinds of um, inroads made by all kinds of industry, like mining, um, ended up resulting in the death or loss of a lot of indigenous um, populations and environments. And so that could be part of why the train is associated with one that might be older. <laughs> Are those tanker trains or? There's, it seems to me like there is a tanker there. 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 And and yeah, and there as well. Yeah. But you know, it reminds me of you saw his birth in 1954. I think a lot of boys right. had a Lionel train set. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yes. that's what that reminds me because my brother yeah. had that. So that's where I'm that's thinking on stage. That's interesting. I'm thinking it's part of his childhood. Very good. Is that yes. Yes. Of a few bullet time to top the train. He did. It, it, it was a people. He didn't do very much of it. Yeah, absolutely. Did you read the biography or something? That way, no, it was people. Yeah, so I he, don't see the association between all four of those units necessarily. Okay. Especially the one in the upper right mm -hmm. to the bottom. I see that association mm -hmm. between the bottom. Yes, that's interesting. Yeah, he I, seems a counterpoint. You've got the iron horse versus the cowboy nice. riding the animal. And then you've got the ant, the ant mover of her versus the mechanical ones. He's doing counterpoints. So this chiastic line yeah, relationship right. are really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, the diggers of the earth and then the carriers. Yes. I'm like, it's very funny. It seems like the Kachina doll is buried. And so... Yeah, I agree with the Hopi Indians versus the cowboy. Yes. Um, and then, you know, down below the other, the mechanical counterpoint. Right. So, yes. So the, the, it, the explanation yeah. about the train that you were saying that with the idea of the, with the Southwest maybe gives a little more insight into sure. the aqueduct with the idea of oh. irrigating water. Carrying water. Maybe. Oh, mm -hmm. God, I didn't even ever think about that. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking you were going to the Kachina and the Cowboy as being connected to that Southwest, but yeah, you're right. I mean, that, that's an association. Um, I mean, even the Anasazi culture that's associated with some of the imagery that Borovich <coughs> used is, so, is thought to have been um, forced to leave its region because of water issues or resource issues. Um, but those gears that you see in the sky are also an image that Wojnarowicz shot when he was in Mexico. So there is a lot of um, Southwestern and Mexican imagery infiltrating. But I, I'm interested in why he chose the image of an aqueduct, which really I think it's more to ancient Rome. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a train bridge. I think it's a train bridge. A train bridge. Representing yeah. distance. But it does, I mean, I keep thinking of the Pont Neuf. Yeah. Right, right, right. But I don't know, you're right. It also is very much Roman mm -hmm. <laughs> architecturally. Um, structure like the gears, rib cages, your structure. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
lie there. It, and I don't, I don't discuss, I know you have the title on your sheet, and I don't know if anybody noticed, but did that title trigger anything for anybody as you were looking at the Yeah, because it's, it's kind of a, I mean, he has the globe, so it's kind of a description of, of various parts of the Earth, yeah. but each of the quadrants also have elements of the Earth in it. So, I mean, one looks like cracked Earth, one looks like, mm -hmm. you know, stones that have been disrupted, the other is like mining. So they mm -hmm. all seem like aspects of the Earth. Yeah, and I think back to the point you were making about not seeing yeah. the connection, and maybe that's what also the tells us the Earth. The element yeah. of Earth. Yeah. When did Earth start? And, um, when did it really start? Well, so maybe it would be a good time to turn and look at the rest of the, the series. So this was a series that he created all at one time. Um, we've been looking at Earth, but you can see fire and wind instead of air and water in the right-hand corner. And the, the timing of this series is really interesting because he was coming off of um, a whole chain of interests that had preoccupied him for most of his artistic career and transitioning into a dedicated focus on the AIDS crisis. Because that actually had been something he had been blocking out of his mind for a lot of the years that AIDS was emerging. Um, but by 87, which is when one of his closest friends, a guy named Peter Hujar, had died, and he had spent the last couple of years of Hujar's life taking care of Hujar. Um, he, and because after that death, he also tested him, had himself tested and tested positive, he started training all of his attention on the AIDS crisis. So this is really, in some ways, the last body of work that isn't absolutely about AIDS, but on this, the other hand, it's hard not to also see some of the themes of AIDS emerging in a number of ways. And, and those of you who pointed to the leaf mold as a kind of fungus or growth or even cancer association of disease. I have to say that I like this a lot better seeing the total context of this. It, it um, makes more sense to me. Yeah, I can totally agree with you. I, and um, I don't know if you're interested, but if you want to see all of them together, they are now all housed at the Museum of Modern Art. They weren't originally, but sometimes when the museum does put them all on view, it, it, it is the best way to see them, and you can see them all at the same time and have them bounce off of each other. And I think it's when you see them all together that you realize that part of the project is this attempt to create a kind of cosmography or a cosmogony, this sort of total world representation. I mean, if you think about what the four classical elements are, they were initially intended to, in some ways, explain everything, like what makes the world, what makes the universe. And so we're looking at this artist's proposal for both how he saw those elements represented, but also maybe a proposal for what other aspects of the world maybe are not usually acknowledged or could be acknowledged to make up the world. And I think that comes across in some of them more than in others. This um, element in the bottom left, fire, was the first one that the museum bought. And then they purchased that one. And then those two on the right were owned by a couple who um, have promised the museum the, when they're gone. So, but right now they're housed in the museum. So if you do get a chance to see all four together, I highly recommend it. Um, you say they're on view now? They're not on view now. The last time that they were on view was 2008. There, I should mention, um, there will be another major Wojnarowicz exhibition taking place in New York in 2016 by the Whitney Museum of American Art. And so I would imagine that there might be some dovetail programming by other museums, possibly including MoMA. And so maybe look for that in 2016, which I'm hoping 
the book will come out by then too. So. All of the four pieces are like really cohesive with their color palette too, which is kind of interesting. I like when you typically think of Earth, you think of green, but he only has that one patch of like, and it's kind of like a dark hole of green. And but yeah. that yeah, the color palette, the primary colors, they're really interactive, which obviously has like a plethora of symbols. But like with the colors, you know, he's kind of pointing them all out and like mapping it out and inviting the viewer with like the childlike, you know, primary color palette. Which I thought was kind of That's a, those are great observations. I really appreciate all of the comments you guys have been making, and, and that last one um, especially ties into another point somebody made about the train being a, a toy. Um, a number of the figures that show up here are actually from toys, like the rubber um, devil with his hands up in the air is a little toy rubber, um, a little rubber toy devil, and, and the number of the the dinosaur in wind comes from a toy. So that's a really interesting observation. I <clears throat> am, I'm especially intrigued, and this is again something I've seen more recently and not the first several thousand times I looked at these. The, the root work that structures Earth has comparable kinds of structuring systems in the other poses. So in water, for example, it never really occurred to me to think about it this way, but um, a recent biography that was written about Voynovich by a woman named Cynthia Carr pointed out that this form here is like a droplet. In, um, so you might look for the, that kind of structuring system in each of the four. The, the systems are derived from the specific elements that each is associated. And I don't know if it's useful to, for you to think about these paintings this way or, or think about future examples of contemporary art this way, but in terms of how this particular artist approached his motifs, what he did was actually list his associations with each element in advance of making any of these paintings. So he had a, a chain of <coughs> verbal cues first, in a way, and then he started constructing building with those cues structure that result. I don't want to run out of time. Um, does anybody have any other observations or questions about these works before we move on to one more example? <coughs> you mentioned that he was also um, in Mexico where he took that picture. And um, the, in Mexico, there's a railroad that travels all the way north to the, the southwest. And it's kind of like a, they call it, like, I don't remember the specific name, but it's like the evil machine, right? Because a lot of people jump on the train and, you know, try to come to the United States. But back in um, the 60s, I believe, it was, there was a movement of the Braceros where they would, um, they were coming into the country with um, permission to work the farms. And so it's interesting that it's it's a broken, right? It's a broken system yeah. and there's, a, I don't know, just a lot of blood and bloodshed, right? And so, and I just think Thank you. That's really interesting. And I, actually, the um, observations people have made about color, I really appreciate, and they would help us segue, I think, into the next um, example that I'd like us to spend some time on. And um, it, it's related to, um, well, one of these artists. Um, so these are, again, Northern Renaissance era artists. And we're really going to only have time to focus on one of them, but the other one is actually um, as work represented in the Toledo Museum of Art. So I hope that you have a chance to go and look at that work as well and maybe think about some of what you discover in this um, next work. Um, so we're going to look at this work by Peter Erickson. And forgive me, Larry, if I'm butchering the pronunciation of his name. Perfect. <laughs> um, and this particular painting called Meat Stall, and um, oh. you might be familiar in part with this artist because Erickson is credited with pioneering a number of genres, but in particular the genre of still life. Um, 
So the detail here actually gives you a clue about how I first learned about this artist and his work from this amazing article that appeared in Art Bulletin by a woman named Charlotte Hofton. And it was an article that actually helped me understand just how contemporary all artwork is, even artwork that was made in the past. Um, so if you do get a chance to read that article, I highly encourage it. But once again, I'd like you to think about and answer any of the questions on the worksheet. Um, feel free to pick and choose, but do try to initiate the process by focusing on just what you see and what you recognize and writing it down. And if anyone needs a new worksheet, I have extras. Um, but I will give you five to ten minutes again to spend some time looking at this image. So if anybody needs
think formally it's, it's amazing. And the, the composition to me, and not 100%, but very subtly, everything from like the trees to the, some of the beans, the sausages, they're all kind of directing my eye to the, the unfinished product at the bottom. The most startling thing is the cowboy with the steer head. And it, the more you look at some of these lines, whether it's like the man's thigh or one of those beans and the trees above the cow's head, even one of the fish kind of takes you right down to the cow. You know, it's all sort of directing you from the finished product to the source material. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I apologize for anyone in the room who's a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> it's good it's for our <laughs> uh, Could we get a detail of the, of the horse? I mean, that middle. Uh, I think the one I have, I don't know how much of the detail it can give you, but um, that's about as close as I can get. See that? It, and it's a, an ox. Where's there a horse? Oh, it's it's an ox. An ox. Oh. It's, and it's been flayed. So we're not looking at that. No, the one that, oh, is the woman sitting on something and handing them. Yeah, there is a whole scene back yeah, there. Yeah, there's, there's, the background. Background. there's sort of a foreground and a background. There is. There's all yes. the three different parts in the background. Okay. But I can't, I can't, you know, I can't see what it is. So she is sitting on something, yes. It's like a horse. A donkey. It's a donkey. Oh, it's like oh. the mother of Mary. Yeah. And it is Mary. Yeah. Yeah. And it, because of the donkey, it, it also helps you know what you're looking at. Right, and yeah. then just look at the position of the fish. Oh, it's like be. almost like a cross, and fish are peace. Yeah. So I thought that was just so interesting how they just intersect like that. So. And the trees are crossed. Yes. I find it interesting the difference in the in the, the technique of the composition. I mean, everything in the front is so super realistic, whereas the view through the windows is, is kind of very stylized, like it comes from a different era altogether. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. It seems like a completely different. That's what I was going to say. That up front looks like a completely different painting than this view in the back. If Even the colors. The I'm going to move back to the full one while you're you're talking. Please go on. See, it just, it looks like you're looking at a TV screen. It looks yes. completely different. Even the scenes on the other side. So the foreground is much yeah. more brighter and the back is much more muted and, and um, which yeah. just happens with your eye. You see, you see things much That's more. true. That's true. Do we know what the sign says? We do. So it, it is in Dutch. I can't, I don't remember what the Dutch is, but the gist of it is that there are 154 rods of land for sale behind this scene, and you can have a bit of it, or you can have the whole thing, as you wish. So it's an advertisement for real estate. <laughs> and is, it, oh, is there some significance with the red, orange, pole, and is that like a Roman numeral? Yeah. 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 It's up there? Yeah. I yeah, what is the insignia? It looks kind of religious, actually. Isn't that, yeah. isn't that insignia underneath the... It's like yes, and there are a number of religious references in some of the symbols that appear up here, especially yeah. I don't know if you see those hands mm -hmm. there. Um, I don't remember exactly what the symbol meant, um, but there is a church back here, and apparently the procession of people is actually heading toward church. Is that a sausage ring around the pole? Yes. Yes. And apparently this is a set of lungs. <laughs> yeah, lungs. Basically it's the whole cow. And yes. she's looking at it. <laughs> well, and this is a pig. Oh. And the pig's head. So there is there is a variety of meat here. But is there a tablecloth behind the Structure. Oh, this is yeah, some kind of cloth just to okay. as a support and for the sausage. What about the man who's pouring water? Yeah. The vessel? What do you have from the well? well. And I think maybe my detail just before yeah. this so might help us see a little bit more. Uh, yeah. So what? Well, what do you see back here? A bar. There's a bar. Or like where you eat. Kitchen time. Well, it looks like this man has his shirt off, so maybe he's like ill or he's back to being cared for. Oh, yeah. You know, this other mm -hmm. fellow seems to have his hands up in the air, maybe in distress or, you know, it doesn't look like a particularly positive scene back there. It's been described as 
related to uh, um, an allegory or a reference to the prodigal son and a scene of debauchery. So I've always interpreted it as a kind of restaurant, bar, in type of space. I mean, yeah. it's not ex entirely clear what each of the figures are doing, but you can see the um, large carcass hanging. And then this figure here, who seems to be part of the staff, who is surrounded by all these oyster shells. Mm -hmm. right. It's another indication of what's been going on. <laughs> what does that have that? to do with the overall Well, picture? that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. this one of the other genres that this artist is credited with pioneering is described as an inverted morality fiction. Mm -hmm. So the idea that we're actually seeing these objects foremost and prominent as opposed to what's going on in the background is actually a very specific device that he is producing. And, and so remember realizing what this scene is. I see, I see it as all of this carnage in front, and then in the back background, there would be kind of the sacred and the secular. Yes. Kind of going almost oblivious. <coughs> yes. To yes. The carnage. Do you, um, can you tell what the version is doing on the dog? Yeah, no. Besides, it's too it's small. Hand out. Giving yeah. something. Oh, or something. She's, she's giving alms. Yeah. So it's this act of charity going on. It's a beggar and the father of the beggar um, sitting on the side of the road. Oh, it seems so black and white compared. Yeah. yeah. Right. So that yeah. contrast is very dramatic. The idea of the, the profligacy or the abundance of this meat on display in contrast with the scene of spareness. But the, the sign that you guys noticed in the upper right that talks about or references this real estate scandal that was going on is also a really interesting twist on some of the information back here. And, and, and I mean, it, I think with older forms of art, you have to pay attention to things like patronage and what prompted the works to begin with. And in this case, there's absolutely no documentation. But I think partly in terms of where the painting ended up early in its provenance, it's come to be believed that it was probably um, large, powerful trade groups like the Butcher's Guild of Antwerp oh. that had something to do with the motivation for this work. Huh. But they are also connected to some of the scandals that this work seems to be making reference to, like the real estate scandal. And, and there was a lot of pressure on, I mean, I was Reading some of the history of this time period in Antwerp in the context of this painting, and it, it actually kept reminding me of our contemporary world, and for example, the way um, jobs get outsourced. So in, in Antwerp, a number of people were trying to take advantage of um, using labor pools outside the city, because then they could benefit from um, a cheaper labor pool, and, and then there was pushback for that, but there was also um, attempts to try and figure out how to make that occur. And so one of the things that happened was um, that uh, a large parcel of land got appropriated by the city in order to resell it, in, in order to allow the city to recover from an impending bankruptcy it was going through but also in, a, in order to enable a number of these um, industrialists to move forward, or these real estate developers to move forward. So Erickson may have been making reference to that with the sign, but also the kind of contrast you see between the um, ab abundance and availability of all of this um, trade and what's going on in the background. There's, there's so much, there's a dense amount of literature related to not just this painting, but to another genre that is associated with Erickson, the market genre, that I think will be relevant, especially to the painting you might take a look at at the Toledo Museum of Art. Um, Buechler, and again, forgive me, Larry, I don't know how to pronounce that name, but anyway, um, how do you pronounce it? Uh, Boikelar. 
Boy Kalar, thank you. How do you pronounce the first name? You were spot on. No. From my understanding. I, yeah, you were very good. But, but no, I mean, Joaquin, Joachim, how oh. did it have been said? Boy, Boy Kalar's first name. Joachim Boy Kalar. Joachim? Yeah. Was the nephew of Peter Erickson um, by marriage. Peter Erickson married the aunt of Boy Kalar. And both of them became um, very important as initial pioneers in the, the genre of kitchen and market scenes. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of other issues that we could think of or that could come to bear on both the Erickson theme but also possibly the Boy Kalar theme that have to do with issues about, um, well, there, as with a lot of works of art, there's multiple layers of meaning, right? So there are often sexual innuendos going on. But there's also um, apparently ancient texts like the um, reading of Cicero that was leading to the belief that certain trades were um, more scandalous than other trades. And apparently, again, in terms of the economy, um, middlemen were to be despised because of, I guess because of the opportunity for profit making. So, and I'm not sure if that's at all coming to bear in this painting or not, but um, very often in some of the kitchen market schemes that are related to um, both Boy, Boy Collar's work and some of his, um, some of the artists who were inspired by him, um, we're looking at trades that are considered in somehow somehow to be giving into the senses, giving into indulgences or the pleasure of things in a ways that seemed to go against the grain. So if, if this is a moralizing image, so that kind of moralizing may be going on here. I'm not sure. I'm still not sure what's going on in this painting. So what do you guys think? The placement of her hand, I think, is very suggestive. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, who, I mean, because he is clearly a poultry seller, but are the two of them also buying to sell or buying to keep? I mean, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, that looks like and a lady. And why is her arm for short? The one in sort of that coral? Look how short the forearm Well, she's so. further back. So she, she's another customer waiting to mm -hmm. look yeah, at the her hat and her I think it's the mother. I think maybe it's some, maybe they're going to get, she wants to marry this guy. The disapproving look on the older woman's face could be maybe about the, the chickens, but yeah. also about the supposed relationship. Why does the poultry seller have his hand behind Yeah, that, that someone's yeah, like... Married. He might not be in his I'd be happy to meet you upstairs and work out some ideas with you.